good day. Ever since the Russian forces pulled out of Kharkov region from Izium and Kupiansk um, in the middle of September, following the Ukrainian counteroffensive in Kharkov region, I've been saying that one particular area where the Russians have been failing badly has been in public relations, in explaining what was going on, not so much to the outside world, but to people on their own home front, to people who uh, in Russia, who obviously follow the news about the war very closely, and of course to the various sprawling Russian members of the sprawling Russian commentariat who discuss the war at exhaustive detail. And I suggested that one thing that Russia might want to consider doing is having a military officer touring the television studios in uniform, perhaps explaining what was going on, explaining what decisions were being taken, perhaps giving people in Russia some reassurance, some sense of the direction of the war, some sense that the Russian leadership does know what it is doing, that somebody is in charge, and that the situation is, however di difficult, at least under someone's control. Well, finally, we got that yesterday in a rather overwhelming um, media performance, television performance, by the new commander of the Russian forces that are participating in this operation in Ukraine, General Surovikin. He gave a television interview and the Russian populace saw him for the first time and it was a quite remarkable performance. Now, if you want to get a sense of it, you'll probably be able to find examples of this on YouTube or on other places, um, uh, in other, you know, if you search the internet. But my own view is that the best um, version, the, the, the best version of the interview shows Surovikin in action and provides subtitles in English of what he said is on one of the Russian Telegram channels, one called Slav Slavyangrad. But and as I said, there are many others, and you can find transcripts also. But I think the transcripts do not fully convey uh, the sense of force of Surovikin's personality. For one thing, he looks like a bull. <laughs> I mean, he's, he comes across, I don't know how, how big he actually is. Television cameras can be misleading about this, but he, he comes across as a massive and rather physically powerful man. Perhaps he is, perhaps he's not, but certainly that was how the impression came across to me. And he has a way of speaking which involves uh, brief pauses, followed by long, compli complex, but very emphatic sen sentences, which set out in a remarkably structured way exactly what he wants to say. And I'm going to say straight away that an interview of this kind, I am sure, has been carefully pre-prepared. I don't believe that General Surovikin just walked into a television studio and was confronted with questions from an interviewer that he wasn't um, familiar with in advance, but that doesn't take away from its effect. So what did Surovikin say? Well, he said a number of things. He spoke about uh, Ukraine as a fraternal nation. Um, he said that um, he feels that Ukraine and Russia should one day become friends again, that they should become friendly to each other. This, by the way, suggests that if there is a plan to absorb Ukraine into Russia, um, at least at least not a plan maybe, but an option to absorb Ukraine into Russia at the end of this war, as Putin's words in Astana last week seem to leave open. Well, nobody has told Surovikin, but given that he is the military commander, perhaps at this stage, he wouldn't be informed or advised about these sort of political decisions. But anyway, 
putting all that aside, um, Sir Ravikin said an awful lot more that was extremely interesting. Firstly, he said that Ukraine is now throwing everything it has into the battle. He spoke derisively of the quality of Ukrainian troops. He said that most of them now are uh, reservists who've been called up and are ill-trained and ill-equipped and are being thrown into battle against Russian defences and that they're being killed in huge numbers. Some reports of this interview have said that he said that Ru Ukrainian losses are running at the rate of 600 to 1,000 a day. I, I have to say that the versions of the interview which I have seen and what I consider to be the more reliable transcripts of the interview don't give figures that are that precise. They say that Ukraine is losing, hun is suffering hundreds of casualties every day, but they don't say 600 to 1,000. They don't give figures of, at that level. He said that, anyway, to continue with what Suravikin said, he said that, um, he, he went on to say that um, the um, um, Ukraine is carrying out these offensives against Russian defences. It's rather curious to hear him talk about Ukraine attacking the Russian army. I think most Ukrainians will feel that if, they, if, there, if there's been an attack, if there's been anybody has been attacking anybody, it's been Russia attacking Ukraine. But then, of course, Surovikin is a Russian general, so perhaps it's unsurprising that he would say that. But he picked he conveyed a picture of Ukraine under the rule of what he described as a criminal regime, casting clear doubts about its legitimacy, and perhaps implying that its days are numbered. But anyway, Ukraine, under a criminal regime, throwing thousands of poorly armed, poorly trained conscript soldiers into battle against prepared Russian defences and suffering hideous casualties. A, a perspective of the war, which, by the way, if you take out some of his more political and emotional language, I think is not that far from the truth in many respects. But anyway, um, Surovikin also said that the regime in Kiev is acting essentially under NATO orders. He spoke of Ukraine as essentially a country occupied or controlled by NATO and by the collective West, and of Russia wanting to liberate it from that kind of control by the West. But importantly, he said that under NATO pressure, the Kiev regime is now going to attempt to launch some sort of huge offensive in Kherson region. And it was specifically in Kherson region that he spoke about. He said that though the situation along all the front lines is tense, in other words, there's fighting going on, it is in Kherson region that the major crisis is supposedly coming. And he spoke about Ukraine being prepared to carry out what he called prohibited acts. Now, so far as I can tell, those prohibited acts that Surovikin was speaking about were an attempt to destroy the Novaya Kakhovka Dam. And other Russian officials have been talking about this. And the plan appears to be, or at least the Russians claim that it is, to flood this whole area to cause massive uh, problems to civilian infrastructure, um, to presumably make Russian the, the role of Russian defense more difficult. And he linked the decision by the authorities in Kherson region and by the Russian authorities generally to start evacuations of people from Kherson region very much to what is happening to this threat to this dam 
and also to the fact that as part of this offensive that Ukraine might be preparing, um, there's a high probability of heavy shelling of Kherson city and um, by the Ukrainian military. And then uh, Surovikin also said, and this is perhaps the most interesting part of his interview, that he would make decisions about what happens in Kherson according to the development of the situation and that he's prepared to make the most difficult decisions. Now, earlier in the interview, he talked about how the Russian front lines are strengthening, how defence positions are being improved. Um, and that, by the way, is correct. Um, we know that more and more reservists are Russian reservists, trained reservists, people, many of them have served, as I said, in the military quite recently. Many of them are now back on the front lines. The numbers of troops in the Russian forces is growing again. And we've also had reports that in many places now, the Russians, in anticipation of further Ukrainian attacks, have been building up fortifications, and they do seem to be working hard to build up reserves as well. So he talks about how the um, front lines are strengthening, but he did also say that in Kherson region, he was prepared to take the most difficult decisions. Now, of course, he didn't tell us what those were, but I am going to say straight away that I believe that one of those difficult decisions, which he's not ruling out, it's not a decision that he has yet made, he's made, it, made that very clear, but if the situation in Kherson region goes badly wrong, he is prepared to pull Russian troops back across the river, across the Dnieper River, to the east bank of the Dnieper River. He is prepared to abandon Kherson city if the situation calls for it. So I want to say that, I want to get that out of the way because that's that is the clear impression that I got from General Surovikin's words. Now, what impression did this interview give? As I say, he didn't give an impression, he didn't go out of his way to say, you know, all is well, we're advancing on every front, Ukraine is losing on every front. He gave what some might call not exactly a bleak picture, at least a very difficult picture of the war. Well, interestingly enough, as I understand it, the response across Russia, and certainly across the sprawling Russian commentary community, has been overwhelmingly positive. They, they saw Surovikin, as I said, this rather overpowering looking man, this very powerful looking man, as I said, with this very interesting method of delivery, perhaps a method of delivery typical of Russian generals, for all I know, but um, anyway, it's the first time I've seen it, uh, I've been exposed to it, and I have to say it was both unusual, and I personally found it quite impressive, but there it is. But anyway, mo most Russians have see seen that, and I think they've come, came away with the impression that this was somebody in charge, who knew what he was doing, uh, um, was in control of the situation, was making the right decisions, could be trusted to make the right decisions, and had a clear objective of what he wanted to achieve. And Surovikin went out of his way to say that his overriding priority was to protect civilians and the lives of Russian soldiers. The latter being, of course, particularly important when Russia has been calling up reservists to engage in the war. So that was what General Surovikin said. Or rather, as I said, uh, impressive uh, in its way, not offering, as I said, an over-optimistic picture, but my own impression from what I've been able to, the sense I've been able to get, is that he pitched it, or whoever his media handlers perhaps were, who advised him that it was all pitched, this interview was pitched in exactly the right way. So quite an impressive, overwhelming performance, and one that 
all the Russian channels have been buzzing with. And in fact, we have been getting lots of reports about people being evacuated from Kherson region. There was um, reports yesterday that the governor of um, uh, Kherson region, Mr. Saldko, I hope I've got his name right. I, my eyesight makes it difficult sometimes for me to read names. I've been told that my previous pronunciation of his name was wrong. Anyway, he's ordered the evacuation of four particular areas of uh, Kherson region, not so far Kherson city, by the way. But apparently around 60,000 people are being evacuated. This, the areas which from which these evacuations are taking place are those which presumably would be um, threatened if the Novaya Kakhovka dam really was destroyed and there really was flooding. Um, but also, or so it seems to me, they are places close to the front lines where it seems to me that the Russians look like they're probably going to build fortifications. Um, now, and, and perhaps, as I said, they're prepared at some point to evacuate these places as well. But for the moment, as I said, my impression was that the Russians are intending to fortify these places and that the plan is not so much at the moment to abandon Kherson as to build defensive barriers to fortify the city, to hold on to the city, to inflict as much injury and damage to Ukraine as possible if and when Ukraine does launch this great offensive that we've been hearing so much about. And I would add that Mr. Saltko um, has also said that uh, nobody is planning at the moment to withdraw from Kherson city. So it looks as if, for the moment, there is no decision, certainly no decision yet, to evacuate from Kherson city. Though my impression of what Surovikin said is that it's an option that he's not prepared to exclude if he has to do it, if he thinks that's going to preserve the lives of civilians and of the Russian military grouping west of the Dnieper River, he's going to do it. And um, I think that's absolutely clear. I would add, by the way, that I am sure that it is Surovikin himself who is the person who is behind these evacuation orders. Since he came in, he's looked at the situation in Kherson region. He's decided that the situation there is difficult, uh, as he said, and he's decided that the civilians need to be taken out of harm's way, and this must be done fast. There's also some reports that the civilian administration in Kherson city has also been ordered to transfer to the east bank of the Dnieper. This I can't confirm, by the way. I saw one report and it was very brief and I'm not able to say whether or not it's true, but perhaps it is. But anyway, he's made these decisions. At the moment, the intention clearly is to fortify and defend Kherson city in anticipation of this great offensive that the Russians believe is coming. Uh, but, if Kherson cannot be held, if holding on to Kherson is going to cause the lives, the loss of soldiers and civilians, Russian soldiers and civilians, civilians who, of course, the Russians now consider to be Russians since the formal incorporation of this territory into Russia. Well, in that case, Surovikin is prepared to order that evacuation. Now, what is the military situation in Ursan region at, like at the present moment in time? Now, early this morning, I heard more news about Ukrainian forces mounting attacks in Ursan region. I have to say that they don't remotely, or so it seems to me, live up to the impressions given by a lot of Russian officials. Uh, by people in the West, on telegram channels of some great 
offensive being underway. Apparently, there was another attempt to advance towards Novaya Kakovka and ultimately Berislav, uh, towards the dam, um, along the uh, east bank of the Dnieper River. Um, it apparently numbered the, 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 the troops, the Ukrainian troops, allocated to that task, apparently numbered around a thousand men. And the reports I'm getting as of the time of making this program, of course, all of this might well have changed by the time you actually watch this program. But as of the time of the making of this program, the reports I'm getting very scattered, very confused, perhaps not entirely reliable, but probably correct for all that, is that this advance, like so many others, has been stopped in its tracks. The Ukrainian forces were hit hard by Russian artillery and brought to a stop and perhaps have been forced to go into some sort of retreat. But I, you know, have to say, I can't quite confirm whether that is or not the case. What I would say is it just doesn't seem to me yet like this big offensive that people are talking about. Now, I, I would come back to what some suggestions were, some suggestions that would be made yesterday, which is that this big offensive isn't happening this week. It's happening next week, uh, supposedly, and that these are allegedly just probing attacks attacks being carried out to identify the weaknesses in the Russian positions. I have to say, if that is so, then I find that extraordinary. Sending 1,000 men on that kind of operation, in a force of that size, seems to me to be an unbelievably profligate use of the lives of these men who are being sent to battle in this way. Um, I don't know how many of them were killed in this battle or have been killed in this battle, but a reconnaissance on this scale does seem to me to be, well, at least for me, extremely difficult to understand. And besides, I mean, there's all sorts of other ways of establishing what is going on on the battlefields, satellites, drones, that sort of thing. Does Ukraine really need to conduct reconnaissance in this kind of way? But anyway, I, I, I'm not going to get into those discussions about things I don't pretend to understand very well. No doubt people on the chats, on the threads to this video can go over that and discuss more precisely what it all means. But overall, um, if it is a risk reconnaissance, I don't understand it. And whatever it is, it looks as of the present time as if it's not achieved very much and has been thrown back. And that, of course, brings us back to General Surovikin, because the way that General Surovikin spoke about the war, the Russian approach to the war, is that as was discussed, by the way, by Scott Ritter on a live stream we recently did with him on the Duran, um, the Russian plan, and Surovikin confirmed it, is not massive, tremendous advances. It isn't even to capture territories exactly. It is to grind down the Ukrainian army. Surovikin repeatedly used that word. He used it twice. I say the, that word, I mean, this is the translation of it, but the expression, I presume, is the same. He said that the Russian intention is to grind the Ukrainian army down. Now, this is something he said that has been the plan, as announced by President Putin, and it's clearly been the Russian approach to this war all along. They do take territory incrementally, steadily, but from the outset of this war, their purpose has been to destroy Ukraine's military. They destroyed, 
as far as they're concerned, the Ukraine's original military, the one that Ukraine started the war with back in March, April, May, June. They're now having to deal with this second military that Ukraine has thrown at them, which was built up with NATO help over the course of the summer. Eventually, at some point, Surovikin does appear to believe, the Russians do appear to believe, that Ukraine will run out of men and machines, and the West will run out of its ability to keep supplying Ukraine with machines, and at that point, the war will end with a Russian victory. That, it seems to me, Surovikin clearly indicated was the plan. That doesn't mean that the Russians don't anticipate or don't intend to capture ground. Of course they do. Of course they are intending to launch offensives in various places to recover lost ground, to capture new ground, to take places like, well, obviously Bakhmut. We'll come to that place in a moment, to Kramatorsk, Slavyansk, perhaps Kharkov, perhaps Odessa. Kherson, they presumably intend to recapture Kherson if they ever do decide to withdraw from it. They're prepared to do, they, they will carry out offensives when they choose to and when it makes sense for them to do. And obviously gaining territory is important, but throughout this war, they have prioritized destroying Ukraine's military, its defense capability, something which far too many people in the West still seem to me to find very difficult to understand. But anyway, Surovikin made that absolutely clear. So that's where we are with the situation in Kherson region. I've discussed a lot about the weather in recent videos. Apparently it is now starting to turn bad. Friday, the rains are going to start falling. The situation is going to become muddy. But it seems that the imperative, the political imperative for Ukraine to launch this offensive is so strong that they're prepared to try and find ways around whatever problems are caused by the mud, even if that slows them down and even if that causes casualties. And Surovikin, for his part, looks like he's preparing to take them head on, but at the same time, he's leaving his options open. He's going to inflict as much damage and as harm to Ukraine as he can, but his priority always is to preserve his own troops. Now, he did say a number of other things, and I'm going to touch on them fairly briefly. He talked about the performance of the Russian Air Force, he said it's carried out, I think he said 38,000 sorties, which may sound a lot, but is actually only a fraction of what the United States did, for example, over Iraq. And um, given that Surovikin was, until recently, the head of Russia's aerospace forces, he presumably was party to the decisions to use this air force, the Russian air force, in this fairly limited way. Um, presumably, it's partly because of Ukrainian air defences, which are still, you know, quite formidable. Certainly, a lot more formidable than those that Iraq had. But I think, to be frank, I think the Russians feel that they're achieving pretty much anything that an air force could achieve, that jets could achieve with their missile and drone strikes across Ukraine. And those, of course, continue at the same level of intensity that they've been doing ever since the day after the attack on the Crimean Bridge. And um, even as I've been making this video, I've been seeing reports that more Ukrainian energy facilities are being destroyed, more infrastructure is being destroyed. It's clear that Ukraine is now facing a desperately difficult winter. And by the way, I've also seen reports that some European central banks are now um, issuing instructions that uh, conversions uh, of, their, uh, of, uh, of euro of euros on their national territories into Ukrainian grivna 
and you know, backwards and forwards, conversions of the Grivna into euros and euros into Grivna on their national territories is no longer permitted, which suggests that these central banks may be thinking that some kind of hyperinflation crisis in Ukraine is on the horizon, or perhaps at least that you, the Grivna is about to lose substantial value. Well, anyway, that's where we are in Kherson region. That's where we are with the missile strikes. Now, it's fair to say these are not the only military events which have been happening um, across Ukraine over the last few hours. The Russians are reporting that there was another amphibious landing by a Ukrainian assault force which tried to capture the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant and that it was defeated and thrown back with heavy losses, which is seems that the persistence of Ukraine in this is, is really quite remarkable. And um, I have to say, um, again, suggests some element of obsession or, as the French would say, idée fixe about this. And perhaps more interestingly still, we're now getting reports that the Russians have gone back on the offensive in um, Kharkov region, that in the area of Kupiansk. It's the Russians who are now gaining ground and the Ukrainians who are losing it. Remember, a couple of, about a week ago, we learned the same thing was happening in the area of Krasny Liman. And one can't help but feel that what's basically happening is that Ukraine redeploying troops from all over the place, stripping its front lines to build up this assault force in Kherson region, is making its front lines in many various places um, increasingly vulnerable. Now, all this is interesting that the Russians are attacking in these places, but again, perhaps the most interesting developments are in and around Bakhmut city. And this morning, there were a whole lot of reports of further significant advances by the Wagner Group and the Russian military. And by the way, <clears throat> I read yesterday that there was at least one brigade of the Russian regular army supporting the Wagner Group in the attack on Bakhmut City. Um, anyway, uh, there were reports that more of the suburbs, the strategic suburbs of Bakhmut City, have now been captured. More territory in these suburbs has been captured. And that the Wagner Group has now almost reached one of the key roads that link Bakhmut City to, uh, uh, to the rest of Ukraine, and which is used by Ukraine for resupply and that this road is now being heavily shelled by the Russian military. And perhaps the most interesting thing of all was that the Ukrainian forces that are defending Bakhmut City, instead of being evacuated from Bakhmut City, they are indeed, as an other report I came across about a week ago, suggested what they're doing instead is that they're concentrating in the center of the city. So instead of Bakhmut being evacuated by the Ukrainians, apparently the intention continues to be to hold it to the last man, to allow perhaps the Ukrainian forces there to be surrounded, to repeat, in other words, what happened in Mariupol, which it seems to me is illogical and, dare I say, it, inhumane, but that does seem to be the strategy. Contrast that with General Surovikin, who talks about the fact that the lives, not just of civilians, but of his soldiers, preserving them is his priority. So, very different style of conducting war. And I have to say, all my misgivings or my concerns 
about the way in which the Ukrainians seem to be intent on clinging on to places like Black Bakhmut and Mariupol are, be are again being reinforced. And I wonder what the reasoning behind this is. Is there some thought that the longer Bakhmut is held, the more the Russians are forced to commit forces to capturing Bakhmut, the easier it will be for the Ukrainians to hold the line in other places. That's a very brutal calculus. War can be brutal, and I, can't, I accept that. But I do wonder whether, if it is a question of holding on to the front lines in other places, <laughs> redeploying some of those soldiers who might be dying in Bakhmut to those other places might be a more humane and cost-effective thing to do. Well, I don't know. Or could it be that in these endless seesaw battles that we hear reports about, but whose existence I cannot confirm, between Zelensky and General Zaluzhny, Zelensky, who wants to cling on to every millimeter of territory, is once again winning out against General Zaluzhny. That at the time of the Severodonetsk Lysychansk battles, Zaluzhny was briefly in the ascendant. He was able to get those troops pulled out of Lysychansk, even if it meant leaving all the heavy equipment behind. But now, perhaps emboldened by his offensives, or perhaps more plausibly, becoming increasingly worried that the political pendulum is turning against him and that the time is running out for Ukraine, um, Zelensky may be insisting that every single millimetre of ground be held regardless of the cost. Anyway, whatever it is, that's the way it's starting to look. And there are reports, by the way, and I think this time we can take them for real, that though most of the fighting continues to be in the suburbs, some Russian troops, including no doubt Wagner organization troops, have indeed penetrated to the center of Bakhmut and are engaging Ukrainian troops there. Anyway, that's where we are on the battlefields. There is a political dimension to what's going on. Um, we got reports late last night that President Putin of Russia was about to convene the Security Council, Russia's Security Council, its top decision-making body. And the Security Council was going to hear a detailed report from Dmitry Medvedev, who is its deputy chair, and who was, has, of course, previously served first as Russia's president and then as Russia's prime minister. In other words, a very senior man. And as I've been making this video, there's been a trickle of information that the Security Council um, has is in discussion with Russia's Federation Council, the highest, um, the highest, the higher house, the upper house of the Russian Parliament, um, on the declaration of martial law in the four regions: Kherson, Zaporozhye, uh, Donetsk, and Lugansk. I think that was predictable, actually, now that they're part of Russia, and some kind of military operation is taking place there. It's entirely understandable that martial law should be imposed on these places, and also that some kind of joint coordination headquarters of some kind um, is also going to be set up, which again, I have to say, um, is again exactly what I would have expected. Um, now, I have not been able to go through all the material that's been pouring out of the Security Council meeting. That I will have to do after this video is finished, and I will no doubt discuss it further in my next video tomorrow. But it is consistent with a lot of what I expected would happen when the decision to annex, or if you prefer, incorporate the four regions into Russia 
uh, was first taken. I said that one of the reasons for that decision, quite apart from whatever ultimate political or geopolitical plans the Russians might have um, for Ukraine, for these four territories, but one of the most pressing reasons why that incorporation or annexation has taken place now is because the Kremlin will want to unify and consolidate political control. It'll be, it wants to have a situation where it is, there is no longer any doubt that people like Denis Pushilin, who heads the regional government in Donetsk, that he is actually subordinate to the Kremlin and must take their must follow their instructions from this point forward. Doesn't mean he's being sidelined or shunted to one side. What it does mean is that the Kremlin wants to control the situation on the ground. It wants its own people there. It wants to set up a clear command and control structure. It's just done that with the appointment of General Surovikin, something which up to now has never happened, for probably all sorts of reasons, but surely one of them was the fact that so many different militias and soldiers of different units uh, were fighting alongside in what was an allied war. We can dispense with all of that now, so we have a single military commander who is General Surovikin, and we're going to have a unified civilian administration being set up as well with emergency powers. And I suspect that before very long, we're going to hear um, who is being put in charge of that civilian administration. This particular person who will now be running the show in the four regions and who will be answerable to the Kremlin, in other words, directly to Putin himself. And also along that, alongside all of that, I understand that some sort of territorial forces are to be created in all of these regions. I suspect that this is an umbrella for some of these militia formations that already exist. They're also being absorbed into the Russian civilian and defense structure. Anyway. I repeat again, I've not got the full details of what the decisions that are pouring out of this Security Council meeting. They are, in my opinion, what I've seen of them so far, predictable and what you might expect at this stage. And they follow logically from the decision to incorporate these regions into Russia. But I will have to go over these decisions in more detail um, after this video is made later this evening when i've got more time read them through and you'll get my proper full analysis of them tomorrow in the meantime switching to the west and switching specifically to britain which is of course the country where i live i'm getting the sense of a sudden collapse here in morale, not so much on the part of the British population, who have already absorbed multiple shocks, but within the political class. I think the events of the last few weeks, Quateng's disastrous mid Chancellor Quateng's disastrous mini budget, um, his forced resignation, the intervention of the Bank of England, and including the political intervention of the Bank of England, the implosion at supersonic speed of Prime Minister Liz Truss, the sense that the Conservative government is now almost at the end of its road, all of that signals the first moment of realisation, the dawning realisation, by the political class, not just by the way that part of the political class which supports the Conservative Party, even members of the political class who are affiliated to the Labour Party. I think this is the first moment 
when they finally understood how critical and how bad the situation in Britain is becoming. And one thing more than any other, to my thinking, signals the extent of the decisions that have to be made in the face of this. And of course, it's a decision which must fill every part of the political caste with huge foreboding. Now, there's been much discussion in the media about Kwarteng's tax proposals. But as I've said on many occasions in several places, if you're looking at the overall problems with his mini budget, the tax proposals were only a very small part of it. I've seen one figure suggest that they were that their total cost would have been around two, perhaps three billion pounds. Perhaps that's an underestimate, I don't know. But the single biggest cost for the British Treasury was Kwarteng's decision to support household budgets with respect to energy costs. And that was going to cost £150 billion, an astronomic amount of money, and it was expected to go on for two years, in other words, until the election. Well, the British government has now been forced to accept that it can only continue for as long as April, even if it continues as long as that. So in April... British households are going to be faced with a huge, huge further surge in energy bills on top of the surge in energy bills that they had to absorb um, in April of this year. And in the meantime, of course, Britain's budgetary position has been weakened. And what this signals, what this event has signalled, is that Britain cannot indefinitely sustain the economic costs of this war of economic attrition that they so fecklessly launched alongside all the other Western powers back in February when they decided to impose their sanctions on Russia. Now, you won't find anybody putting it as simply as I've just done. But why are energy costs rising across the West. Why have the situation become so difficult with energy across the West? It is a product of the economic war. And there is also um, signs that things on other fronts might not be going so well either. Um, at the moment, gas prices in Europe have fallen and they've probably done so, this is my own personal view, because of the various steps that European governments have been trying to take to try and screw them down. It's very much like the way in which the Biden administration tried to put downward pressure on oil prices ahead of the midterms by, um, by um, releasing oil from the US's strategic reserves, depleting those reserves. I think this is sustainable. And in fact, we're getting more reports showing how unsustainable it is. First of all, some of the LNG producers are getting increasingly angry with this policy. So Qatar has apparently indicated that it is no longer prepared to supply Europe with LNG. We've seen that um, American producers are now charging very high prices f to Europe for LNG. The amount of LNG that can be supplied anyway is limited and as I discussed in my video yesterday the Qatar uh, the um, energy minister of uh, um, Qatar has now also come forward and said that Europe doesn't seem to have a long-term plan about what to do with gas and energy beyond trying to somehow get through this winter which it might be able to do but already I'm reading in the Financial Times, long article today in the Financial Times, 
discussing growing fears within Europe, European industrialists, about a process of deindustrialization across Europe, first and foremost, of course, in Germany, that that process of deindustrialization is now starting to take hold. So it's all looking very grim on the economic front. It's looking very grim on the political front. There's an article in the Daily Telegraph by an economist, a good economist, called Jeremy Warner, who warns that Britain's problems today, which everybody expects are going to spiral into the financial system at some point, that they're simply a precursor of what's going to come to Europe also fairly soon. And about that, I agree. So there is a sudden collapse in morale within the political class, an understanding, a dawning understanding that this situation is turning extremely grim and that there may be political consequences. In Britain, the Conservative Party seems now to be reconciled to the prospect that it is going to lose power and that it is going to lose the next general election. What they're doing is thrashing around for an alternative to Liz Truss, who could, they can put up as Prime Minister for two years, in the hope that this person, whoever he or she is, can somehow limit the damage. So that instead of losing two or 200 MPs, as some are saying, they might only lose 50 or something like that. Anyway, that quite why any political politician would want to become Prime Minister to fulfil that kind of role, of course, that's another question. Liz Truss herself, by the way, has been keeping a very low profile. She failed to attend Parliament on Monday, um, causing a lot of unkind jokes to be spoken about her and one of a minister even talked about her hiding behind a desk um, virtually everybody accepts that her credibility such as it was has been shattered so there's a sudden collapse in morale amongst the political class they suddenly have understood they finally understood at least in britain the disastrous direction in which they've been taking the country. I don't see any sign at the moment that on Ukraine they have decided to change course. But in this atmosphere of demoralization and panic, perhaps that may change. Anyway, there's been one other very strange development, one which I don't understand and have no information about, but which does seem most odd. And that is that the British Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, who some people were in the Conservative Party were hoping would stand to replace Truss as Prime Minister, and who seemed briefly to be considering the idea, has now not only categorically rejected it, but instead he's made a sudden, unexplained dash to Washington for consultations with US Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. Now, it's not at all clear what these two men are supposed to discuss. Some of the media is saying that the British and the Americans have been spooked by Russia's use of kamikaze drones in Ukraine and that this has suddenly caused the Western powers to consider that in future wars they might not have air superiority. Possible. It could be others are suggesting that Wallace is going to try to get the Americans to increase shipments of long-range missiles to Ukraine and perhaps air defense missiles to Ukraine. Who knows? <clears throat> there is, it seems to me, a particularly 
weird twist to this story, which I have to say is based on media chatter. I don't really know whether it's true, but it does seem a very strange uh, report and not one I would have expected to see. And that is that Wallace has decided to go to Washington because the British and the Americans feel that their communications are no longer secure. So the implication is that the British and American defence secretaries, the two key allies at the heart of the Western alliance, key allies since the Second World War, are not able to communicate with each other over a secure line. Someone, supposedly, is listening in. Who, precisely? The Chinese? The Russians? Ben Wallace or Liz Truss's political opponents? There was an odd report yesterday, not a, this is confirmed, that Germany's chief of cyber security has just been sacked because of supposed Russian links, which I, I have to say I find, again, bizarre. I mean, one would have expected a person like that would have gone through relentless vetting. So I wonder what exactly is going on. But regardless, Wallace's sudden dash to Washington, about which no doubt we will be getting some explanation eventually, does, it seems to me, add to the whiff of panic, which at least in London is now in the air. Well, whether that panic will spread to other places, I don't yet know. I suspect that a lot will be determined by the outcome of the midterm elections in the United States on the 8th of November. I understand that the um, that McCarthy, the Republican politician who will most probably be the Speaker of the House of Representatives, if the Republicans, as everybody expects, do gain a majority in the House of Representatives. I gather that McCarthy has already said that if the Republicans do gain control of the House, further support for Ukraine will start to reduce. And I suspect also that if the Republicans gain control of the Senate, which is now starting to look possible, that might also create pressure to reduce American support. This is not because Republicans are soft on Russia. It is, I suspect, because for many Republicans, this is primarily Joe Biden's war. And besides, I, don't, I suspect that many of them don't want to give him anything that might look like a victory in Ukraine if that's what they think might happen. And they are also coming under increasing pressure from their electoral base, which has made its scepticism about the war apparently very clear. I should say that we did, a, on the Duran, uh, an outstandingly interesting uh, live stream with Robert Barnes, uh, the American lawyer, who discussed all of that in great detail. Anyway, that's where we are at the moment. Um, Gerald Surovikin coming in, giving a powerful interview, giving no good news, but somehow making himself popular, it seems, on the strength of it. Russia pressing ahead with um, evacuations from Kherson region preparing to build up its defences, going on the attack in Kharkov, launching missile strikes um, against uh, the energy infrastructure of Ukraine. Ukraine, for its part, still committed to this offensive in Kherson region, which it has been pushed into conducting by its Western allies. And General Surovikin giving hints that even though he's prepared to resist this counteroffensive, he's not ruling out the option 
of evacuating Kherson city and moving everything, the entire Russian military force, across the Dnieper if he feels he has to. And in Britain, at least, as I said, a collapse in morale amongst the political class, with even the Labour Party looking increasingly uncertain what to do in the very likely event that they might soon be in power. So we're living through interesting times, and I'm afraid the probabilities are that before long they're going to get more interesting still. I'll be back tomorrow with a further programme. Um, I'll be discussing, obviously, whatever new developments there have been on the battlefields and elsewhere. And, of course, as I said over the course of this programme, I'll be carefully taking a careful look at these decisions that have been pouring out of Russia's Security Council and analysing them and giving me giving them giving you my views. Well, that's another hour-long program. Thank you for joining me again today. Remember, you can find us on other platforms, Locals, Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, and of course, Rothkin. And um, on Wednesday, um, I also do uh, live streams on Locals at 1400 hours Eastern Standard Time, except this Wednesday, today in other words, I'm going to postpone that to 2000 hours Eastern Standard Time, because, oh, sorry, 1500 hours Eastern Standard Time, 2000 hours London Time, so 1500 hour, hours Eastern Standard Time, because at, seven, nine, at 1400 hours, I have a conversation with um, um, the Duran, Alex and I have convers a conversation with Dr. Steve Turley, which you're also, by the way, welcome to watch. And um, in addition, remember, you can support us via Patreon and subscribe star. You can go to our shop and buy the amazing things that you will find there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our T-shirts, our sweatshirts, and all the rest. And um, last but not least... If you've liked this long video, please remember to press the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me again today. More from me soon and have a very good day until we speak again.